So I'd like to take a minute or two and introduce myself, uh, and then I'm going to do the same for my lovely panel here. Uh, my name is Shamar Heron. I am the Deputy Director of Michigan Works Southeast. We are your uh, local workforce agency. We cover five counties, which includes, of course, Washtenaw County, but we also cover Jackson, Hillsdale, Lenaway, and Livingston counties. Uh, and we provide everything from uh, an entry-level position all the way over to helping our business community fill those positions and uh, train up staff so that they can move on and create more entry-level positions, right? So this is a time where we're seeing very, very low unemployment rates, that is, but then we are seeing an entire uh, subset of people who are not uh, engaged in the workforce. So our job is to now start to get creative. Our job is not to sit back and wait on the days when we had a line of people waiting outside to come into our service centers. We are starting to go out into community centers. I am really tossing the idea of going out where I think people uh, congregate, which also could be a barber shop, our places of faith, uh, a beauty salon. There are places where folks are at and they are interested in being employed, but how do we get the word out to them? So when you think about robots, you think about cobots, you think about technology that is the size of a speck of dust, how do we start to go out and help people understand that the human element will never go away? So I think all of us can agree, it's an interesting time to be in where everything is heading towards uh, an autonomous approach. We have all sorts of data analytics that can tell us just about any piece of information we want to know, uh, but we still have yet to conquer the human mind. And what does motivation look like? And how do we prepare those who have uh, sort of disengaged themselves from a process that I'm firmly a part of? So it looks like we're doing some resetting here. And you know, uh, I, I said I was going to get this joke in and I'm going to do it because, uh, you know, I, I, my nerves come because I'm in enemy territory. So some of you know this, some of you don't know this. Uh, I am a Buckeye. Mm. Yep, see there's always one or two of us in the room, so be careful. All right, folks. So I'd like to uh, take a second and introduce our panelists. I think we may have one more coming up. Uh, but in the meantime, I'd like to introduce Jonathan Gonzalez. Uh, Jonathan is a graduate of Sierra Metro Detroit Youth Bill Program. He completed an asbestos training and certification and is currently a full-time student attending Henry Ford Community College. He has aspirations to complete a law degree and work in politics. Jonathan, you ready for that? Oh yeah, I'm definitely ready. All right, all right. well welcome. All right, next we have Arielle Johnson. She is the founder and CEO of Fierce Empowerment and Fierce Staffing. Arielle Johnson received her BA in hospitality business from the School of Hospitality at Michigan State University. So your enemy's enemy is your friend. Yes. <laughs> During her second year of college, Johnson made a mother, became a mother, excuse me, uh, and wanted to pay for the support she received. She founded FIERCE, which stands for Female Icons Encouraging Real Concepts of Empowerment a 501c3 nonprofit organization. In an effort to combine her love for the community with her passion for the hospitality industry, Johnson launched Fierce Staffing, a hospitality social enterprise with a special commitment to workforce development. Fierce Staffing provides staffing solutions for hospitality business owners and major event producers, as well as work opportunities for those uh, in the community that are often forgotten. Fierce staffing pays all staff a minimum 
of $14 an hour, which is what they believe to be a true livable wage. So that's phenomenal work that you're doing, Area. And I hear some snaps going on, so keep them up. So as we uh, go through these session or, or through this panel, if you agree with something, you can snap it up for sure. You can clap. Uh, we won't get so spiritual where we'll shout, but uh, <laughs> we do encourage encouragement. Okay. All right. So next, I have to give it up to my classmate. Uh, we won't tell you what year that class was, mm -hmm. but let's say we graduated together from one of the finest high schools in the city of Detroit, which is Persia High School, right? That's right. It's a few of us in there. All right, peppered in. So Coy Mosley, uh, Director of Human Resources at the Empowerment Plan. <clears throat> Coy Mosley is a mother, mentor, mentee, and advocate. She is fueled by her passion to make a difference and help others. Koi is active in her community and known for her generosity and servant leadership. Koi has 20 years of experience in human resources. So she started when she was a freshman in high school. Uh, Koi uh, has 20 years of experience in human resources serving, earning, excuse me, several degrees and certifications in management, strategic management, and nonprofit management. Her experience includes 13 years in nonprofit and five years in local government. Koi believes she is now in a role that marries her passion and expertise. She currently serves as director of HR for the Empowerment Plan, whose mission is to end the cycle of generational homelessness through employment. As HR director for a nonprofit organization with a unique employment model, Koi is heavily involved in the career advancement department. So welcome, Koi. Eula? Hi. How are you? Hi, I'm good. Welcome. Thank you. Eula Walker is a graduate of Sierra Metro Detroit Bridge to Career Opportunities Program and is currently working full time for Local 1191, she is also a registered apprentice. So when we talk about uh, the skilled trades and skills that are not going to go anywhere, you're looking at it right here. You're looking at someone who is going to help us understand how we move a nation forward. Because I joke around with some of the young people I work with and I say, uh, so what happens when your phone goes dead, right? You charge it. But if you don't have people who are regulating that energy, converting that energy, it's not going to happen. So uh, the most important, most powerful tool to our young folks, which is their cell phone, I bring what you're working on uh, straight back to them. So that also goes for the laborers union that you're working with. So thank you for- Local 98 Plumbers Union. Local 98 Plumbers Union, me and Julia, she told, me, she told me that. Sorry about that. My apologies. <laughs> All right. Local 98, Plumbers Union. So welcome. I have a couple questions for you as well. So can we give our uh, panel a round of applause? So I'm just going to jump right in. All right. And if you don't mind, I'll sort of go in this ascending order. And then I have a couple questions I'd like to just lob out to you as a group. But I do have some that are specific for each of you, if you don't mind. OK. So Jonathan, politics. In today's world, you're not scared at all, huh? Oh, definitely not. I'm just ready to jump in and uh, definitely make a change in my community. I, I don't like the way that uh, it was being run as I was growing up as a child. So I definitely want to make it a, a more livable and a more suitable community for you know, the, my fellow youth. Oh, fantastic. So I got a question for you. Uh, what would be your first policy put forward when elected into office? Well, um, when, when I was a child, uh, I was definitely a troubled child. I definitely had my fair share of uh, running into the law. And um, I, I got in some trouble, I'm not going to lie. So, I definitely want to make a change. Where Michigan is one of five states that still uh, prosecute minors as adults, and uh, that's one thing that I want to change because I noticed that uh, they mostly target urban areas, such as the uh, community that I grew up in, Detroit. They target places like Pontiac, Flint, and uh, 
They, bait, they target us as a child just to hold us down. So as we, as we grow into adulthood, we're, we're stuck in this bubble, kind of that, uh, that, that uh, mousetrap. You know, you're stuck in that, that, that hamster that, wheel. The hamster wheel, exactly. So the words out of my mouth. So I don't want, I don't want kids to get in trouble uh, as a child. That, that split decision that you make in 15 seconds re uh, reflect your whole life. So I want to be able to change that so they can learn as a, as a child. And when they grow up, that they learn to not give in to short-term gratification and make the, you know, the proper decisions to lead them to a successful future. Absolutely, and so not only do those uh, brief moments where you make a misstep uh, affect you now, but in the workforce, as we know, even in Washington, we have an ordinance where we're trying to ban the bots across all applications. Uh, how do you help a young person understand hey, this mistake you made however many months or years ago should not be the reason you can't move forward with a productive life, especially if you've already sort of served your time, quote unquote. Uh, so one day uh, locked up to me is too many days, especially for our young people who need to be encouraged, loved, and taught what restorative justice means. So thank you for sharing. Most definitely. All righty. So Ariel. So, in a day and age where the hospitality industry is at the peak for its need of talent, as a connection catalyst, how do you spread the word about the ability to grow in the field, and are there specific skills that one needs to be successful in that space? So, um, first, there are a few specific skills that someone needs to be successful in the hospitality industry. However, it is not largely robust. Um, to be successful in hospitality, you need to be able to smile, you need to be able to have a great work ethic, um, and you also need to have the ability to work um, on a team. Those are things that do not require a GED or I mean you have to be able to solve complex math problems or even necessarily read. Um, we are working on um, today actually just talking about outreach plans of, again, reaching the faith-based community um, because there is almost 40% of households that do not have access to the internet. So they cannot, you know, we have a large social media platform that I take a lot of pride in. Make sure you follow us at your staffing. Mm -hmm. um, but we take a lot of pride in our social media, but not all of the community that we want to reach are able to access our programs and our resources that way. Um, so connecting with the faith-based communities, setting up tables outside of a grocery store or areas, maybe even a Walmart where people are going to have a lot of foot traffic to be able to um, act, see what we're about and what these opportunities are. And to let them know that 50% of general managers in a lot of restaurants and hotels started in entry level positions. And you came in as a housekeeper and once you show that you had the work ethic and the customer service and the, the desire to grow, you're able to actually grow into a, a thriving career and get benefits and things that are, are virtually unheard of for a lot of the community that we serve. So great. It sounds like you're trying to go to where the talent is as well. Yes. So your ability to engage and really tell a story around hospitality is what I think is helping you to be as successful as you are. So continue up on the great work. Right. Right. Hi, Koi. Hey. How are you? I'm great. How are you? All righty. So when I read your bio, mm -hmm. uh, and it speaks to the marrying of your passion and expertise, uh, I feel you are in sort of that golden space or golden place, right? Uh, they always tell you to follow your passions and you'll never work a day in your life. And sometimes that's true, uh, but you may not uh, always get the compensation or the gratification that you need uh, if your passion doesn't really align with your expertise, but you're in that space. So I'd like to know from you, uh, as the director of HR at the Empowerment Plan, what is the culture you work to create, and how do you go about creating that culture? Um, being that first we hire um, very unique individuals, our uh, employment base are displaced individuals. So when they come to us, they come to us um, sometimes very broken, right? Mm. And so originally we try to establish trust. Um, we're hiring people directly from homeless shelters and housing programs. And so um, a lot of times they don't have that support system. They don't have family. Um, and if they did, they would probably be staying with family. Um, and I know it sounds cliche, but we really try to be that support system. We try to be that family. We're more than an employer. Um, so 
I try to and strive to create a culture of supportiveness, um, inclusion, um, and first and foremost, non-judgment. Um, because if you, for us, when we when we hire, we you don't have to we we don't have you check the box. You know what I mean? We we take everyone at face value and try to help them to understand that you are not what you've gone through. Um, and homelessness homelessness is not you know someone standing on the corner with a sign. Homelessness can be um, a mother of four who was in a domestic violence situation and had no other choice. Um, so we just really try to be there, try to be that support, um, and let them know that we are not judging you. We're here to help you and look at the whole person and not just give you a job. All right, great. Yeah. So destigmatizing is one piece, right? Mm -hmm. So once you help the individuals to to have a greater sense of uh, self uh, through really rough process. Uh, you also are giving them scaffolding because we have to be able to allow people to rebuild, build, rebuild. Uh, and I, I know it's a little cliche, but it's not how many times you've maybe stumbled or even fallen, but it's how many times you get up. How do you prepare yourself? How do you prepare yourself for a world that doesn't exist right now? So even in terms of technology, uh, I heard a quote this weekend in Washington, D.C., where it was stated, never has technology uh, moved as fast as it's moving now, nor will technology move as slow as it's moving right now. So as we start to prepare our future workforces, we're going to have to be looking at people of all abilities from all walks of life and every kind of background. So thank you for the work that you're doing. All right. So Beulah. Uh, as a first-year apprentice, uh, you are banking on your abilities that you will learn and sharpen as time goes on. What made you choose to go into the plumbing trade? Is, that what you, is it what you thought it would be, and where do you see areas for growth? What made me go into the plumbing industry was City Detroit water shutoffs uh. in 2014. With the astronomical high water bills, I found a nonprofit organization that were looking for volunteers, and I volunteered with them. And when we went to investigate the issues and the problems, we found out they had plumbing issues, and it, which contributed to some of the high water bills. So we reached out to plumbers from everywhere, and nobody wanted to volunteer their services. And I know why now. Now that I'm a plumber prince, I know why. <laughs> I know why. <laughs> so me and my business partner now, I said, I just do it. Wow. So I'll go into the plumbing trade and find out what it's about. So my journey and my apprenticeship is about the city of Detroit residents, not about me. Mm. It's about them having access to affordable plumbing. Fantastic. Fantastic. So in the time that you've been in the plumbing trade, uh, have you seen areas for growth in the trade? Is there things that can be done a little bit differently or a little more innovatively than, than what you're seeing currently? Well, every, every day, when you're speaking of technology, plumbing is faster than technology. It changes all the time. Um, it changes in your local municipalities. It changes on a national level. So plumbing is a grease lightning career. It changes all the time. Wow. OK, great. So I will always be learning, even when I'm done with my five years, become a master. Even if past the master, you still learn. You have to learn. And we have to remember plumbing is universal. Absolutely. It's worldwide. Absolutely. So I heard a little bit about soft skills. I heard a little bit about lifelong learning. These are character traits uh, and skills that we're going to need for the rest of our life. The minute we start to turn ourselves off to the notion of allowing information to flow in, uh, we're stuck in the water. So I'm going to be all about asset framing today, so I won't say dead in the water, but <laughs> we're stuck, right? Okay. 
So uh, I'll go back up the line. So Beulah, if you don't mind, I'll ask you one more question. Uh, what's the most helpful thing that you have learned during your journey? I learned so much. I learned that from transferring careers that you're not the only one. Sometimes I come from um, the banking and finance industry. I went into the trades in 2016. And you see so many people, careers and jobs is changing. You learn that you're not the only one, but you also have to learn when you're changing that there are no days off. You have to really push. Yeah. So growth and evolution is like an ongoing day. All right. Thank you. Uh, Koi, mm -hmm. you speak of servant leadership. Explain us what that means to you. Um. Although I have like a director in my title and on like an org chart, I may be at a certain place. I see um, myself reporting to all of our team members. Um, I'm responsible for making sure they enjoy coming to work, uh, making sure that we have the right policies in place, um, making sure that once they leave, empowerment plan that they go on to be the best that they can be. Um, you can't do that like with an iron fist. Um, you have to build trust. You have to build relationships. Um, you have to be encouraging. Um, so if my goal is to serve all of our team members, um, then I think I should do a pretty good job. Instead of trying to make yourself look good, if you try to make everyone else look good and make everyone succeed, the organization will succeed in the long run. Great. So empowerment. Empowerment. I, I'm starting to hear a theme here. Mm -hmm. uh, and they say one can lead, but one must lead from within the circle. Mm -hmm. And so it sounds like you, you walk that and live that every day. But also as a community leader, uh, you know our youngins are watching you as well, right? Yep. All righty, good, good. So, Ariel, uh, I'm going to get even more sort of wide open with the question and ask you, what does success look like for Fierce? <sighs> so that is a wide open question. So success for Fierce, um, and to make it clear, Fierce Empowerment is a nonprofit 501c3, um, which actually, fun fact, I got my master's from the University of Michigan Dearborn um, and my master's in public administration with the best yeah. Dr. Tracy Hall over there, who encouraged me not to start a nonprofit because <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what are you doing? Um, because I was also working in hospitality and a, a thriving hospitality career. But that goal is to be able to provide that full um, wraparound support services to the staff that we, that we are placing in the hospitality industry. Um, we also, um, at your staffing, want to set the standard of what customer service and hospitality is in the staffing industry, um, specifically in the hospitality. Um, and I, I feel that the biggest investment that we could ever make is the investment into people, um, and which is something we just heard about. And also, that, that wraparound support services, there's no way to be successful on the job. You're, you cannot run a successful workforce program if you're not solving problems at home. And so if you can't, uh, if you don't know where you and your babies are going to sleep at night, if you don't know how you're going to get to work, if you don't know how your child's doing in school while you're out at work, then you're not going to be able to thrive um, and make our businesses profitable. Um, and so that, um, that is a goal for us to be able to identify the best practices to be able to run our nonprofit, to also be able to um, contribute to the people that are working for us, um, and then setting that standard so we can pay the bills at the nonprofit, too, so <laughs> Dr. Hall won't be right after <laughs> Right, great. So providing resources, those wraparound resources. Often uh, people will send uh, c customers to Michigan Works and say, they need a job. Get them a job, Shamar. And I say, well, we had a conversation with them, and they need a place to sleep at night yes. first. Yes. Uh, it is hard to think about going to work every day if you don't know where your next meal is coming from or where you will lay your head. So we have to learn to prioritize and triage how we're working with people so that uh, we understand this is more than just a client. This is more than just a customer. This is a human being. So we start to talk about uh, a, a notion and an issue of humanity in a time where you think 
uh, technology is going to heal all wounds. It's actually uh, a polarizing uh, attribute because those who can do and those who don't have, it's very hard. It's very hard. And so you hear this, you need to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, right? What if I don't have boots? Right. I know. Okay. It's very true. So let's start to think about uh, concepts like business resource networks. So I don't know if you're familiar with them. Companies can uh, essentially purchase shares of a success coach who will come into your business and sit with those individuals who might be from what we know as the Alice population. Show of hands, who's read the Alice report? So if you want some uh, enlightening reading, check out the Alice report. It was done by uh, your United Way coalitions. Uh, and so you have the opportunity to take a peek into uh, the lives of people who are uh, working every day, but uh, still can't afford to make ends meet. Mm -hmm. So there's a term that I don't like, uh, but I think it sort of describes where these uh, individuals are at, and it's the working poor. Uh, so those who go to work every day and are still struggling to make ends meet. Um, it, it, it's, uh, it's beyond an epidemic. And I believe it's over 40% of the households mm -hmm. here in Granola, Washtenaw County. So people think about us as the land of milk and honey, and they don't understand there is a dichotomy here. And there is a canyon worth of difference for those who can and have versus those who are working to get there. So thank you. Uh, so Jonathan, you, you almost have a politician's name here, Jonathan Gonzalez. I like that, man. I, <laughs> yeah, you're in the district, I'll man. Make yeah, he'll go for it. <laughs> he does. All right. All right. So what is Youth Build? Because you were a part of it, correct? If you can help educate us on what Youth Build is and how was your experience in the program? Okay, well, Youth, youth Build is a, a federally funded program that helps um, people 20, 20, uh, the, from the ages 24 to, I do believe it's 16, uh, help, the, help to get you a GED, high school diploma, and uh, help to cultivate you into the workforce. So that was uh, one thing that I, I, I struggled with because uh, I was a troubled teenager. I, I did get kicked out of school. So they helped uh, bring me back <clears throat> into the community and helped me obtain my GED and um, helped cultivate, cultivate me into the workforce. So they, uh, they started by uh, paying us $15 a day to, just to go to school. So that's an incentive to uh, help uh, be able to feed the students uh, so they can have some money to be able to get back and forth transportation or give them a bite to eat, you know, because some people, some uh, families can't afford that. So that's a good incentive there. And then we, every Friday, they send you out to, um, to a, 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 a community workforce where you kind of help with the community. Um, <clears throat> we, we worked on a, 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 Broderick, a Broderick project, which is a, an apartment building that we're helping uh, renovate and bring it back to its former glory so we can uh, use that as a, as a public housing for future students. So that's a, that is one, face, uh, one issue that students are facing, like, like uh, one of my fellow panelists said, is homelessness. So that'll help solve that. And at the meantime, that'll help give the students, such as myself, the, the skills that we need to be able to enter the, the workforce. So um, as you, as you pro uh, progress in the program, uh, they they do they do offer you union opportunities and apprenticeships such as my other fellow panelists and myself. So they they gave me they were able to pay for the training, my transportation to uh, to the school to get my training in asbestos and abatement, and then they helped me uh, get into the union. Wow, and that's what Youth Build is. Wow, great, you know, great. you into the workforce. Oh, fantastic. That is. And you worked at the Broderick building. I, I know a Broderick. Uh, and even though he's a even though he's a U of M guy, I still think he's a pretty cool dude. Uh, got to meet him at our uh, President Obama's My Brother's Keeper event. And it was really great to see the work happening across uh, the country in terms of preparing our young boys and men of color. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think we all know uh, we are at a sort of precipice where we're going to start to invest and allow our future to get brighter, or we're gonna choose 
the other route and sort of see how it goes. I believe the people in this room are prepared uh, to help us move into a brighter, more prosperous future for everyone. And so my question now to the panel, and uh, you all can duke it out how you like about answering it, but how do we better invest in our future workforce? can take a stab at it first. Um, what we find uh, most beneficial is looking at um, the whole person. Um, like we were talking about earlier, uh, you can't fix one fourth of the problem and expect someone to be successful. Um, in our program, we, like I said, look at the whole person. So if you don't have reliable childcare, we tackle that. If you don't have a driver's license, we tackle that. If you don't have a GED and you want to get it, we tackle that. If you have, um, not necessarily, um, we want, we don't even look at just credit anymore. We could we talk about financial health and wellness. So how healthy are you financially? Do you understand finances? Um, and not only that, your mental health. Um, because that goes into a major part of yes. being successful at work. And so we try to address all of the barriers um, in order for someone to be successful. Because if, we, if you don't, eventually something's going to come back up. If I haven't established reliable child care, I'm not going to be able to keep a job. If I don't have my driver's license or even reliable transportation, I will not be able to get I won't be able to get to work Absolutely. to provide for my family. So I think it starts with addressing all of the barriers that block someone from maintaining a job. Absolutely, and providing all of the, the wraparound support services to address those barriers and addressing the whole person can sound ridiculously overwhelming, mm -hmm. especially for smaller organizations where resources are limited. Um, and I think the way that we're able to solve that is through collective impact. And so um, a lot of what we do at Fair Staffing is we're identifying other organizations who are doing something similar to what we're, we are, housing organization, Detroit Rescue Mission, Goodwill, Brilliant Detroit, and how we can use our resources together to reach this community and make sure, well, you're addressing child care, you're addressing um, getting their, their um, record expunged or whatever, and we're working together to try to make sure we're able to solve these issues. And no longer, especially our, um, the, um, the black community, we tend to work in silos very often. Um, and then a lot of us are doing the same work and not really getting very far. And so I think once we're able to establish um, collectively um, some strategy to really be able to address the whole person, that will be able to make significant impact. Great, great. Beula? So, yeah, we definitely have to help, uh, help the people overcome their obstacles that they're facing. But I also want to mention, too, that we do have a low amount of workforce developers. So mm -hmm. the people that help us overcome these obstacles we're, we don't have enough of those people, and the people and the ones that are are in these uh, in these positions, they're not getting paid enough, especially yeah. especially when they're doing such a great job helping uh, better our community. So we definitely need to raise the pay for career developers, and we need to bring more in uh, so we can get everybody in in an efficient time to be able to start their career and overcome them obstacles in an efficient amount of time. Great. I'm totally voting for you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jonathan, 2020. <laughs> you even got the right garb on and everything. Look at you. You came ready to go, huh? All righty. Beulah, did you want to share? Yes. Um, well, as for me, I would like to see more women in the trades. Yes. Especially plumbing. Nothing against the guys. It's just that it's such a small number of us. We're so, we're so outnumbered. I would like to, um, well, what I do now is um, when I do go do plumbing or go to school, and a lot of times um, members bring their kids in, and it's just so weird how young girls look at me like the Eminem commercial, like, is, it re or is, she, is she real? <laughs> so I would love to, well, I am trying to get more women into the trades, young, middle age, doesn't matter because once you have a trade, you can be self-sufficient and take care of yourself. To teach others. Amen. Amen. Uh, as uh, a self-proclaimed mama's boy, I grew up in a house that had, yes, it doesn't look like it, but I am my mother's baby. <laughs> so, yes. Uh, I grew up in a household uh, with my mother, my grandmother, 
and my six aunts. And three of those six aunts had daughters. So when I hear about the ability of women, I have lived it. I've seen it. And I joke around with my male friends. See, there's a reason our life expectancy is a little lower. When we have issues, we sort of hold it in and sort of grunt it out and just work through it in our own little ways. But I will watch my mother and aunts and grandma corral each other, uh, give them a sense of empowerment, uh, work through their issues through laughter and tears and pain and dancing and music. Uh, and before you knew it, the issue had resolved itself. And so there's a certain quality that is brought to the workforce through the type of uh, development and diversity that you're speaking of, Beulah. And it has to be uh, continued in order for us to grow as a workforce, for us to grow as a country. If we don't start to diversify, if we don't start to think about inclusion in ways we've never thought about before, uh, once again, we, we're going to have to look at ourselves as a country in 20 or 30 years and say, where did we make the missteps? So I'm going to take a second to do a cheesy uh, sort of self-advertisement of a program that's being ran here in Washtenaw County. It is the Summer 19 program where we're going to take 150 young people from the entire county. and We're going to put them to work. And I'd like to personally thank our partners here at Poverty Solutions, Luke and Julia. They have been fantastic in helping bring half of those young people right here on this campus so they can ver learn about the diversity and inclusion office. Mm -hmm. They can learn about what the School of Technology actually does. What happens here in this ornate building, right? How do we start to learn to prepare our future in a way that they can palette? Because it's easy for us as adults to say, when you get in the real world, uh, or back in my day, we did it this way, and I have learned without a doubt, our youth care to know when they know you care. Mm -hmm. Is that fair enough, Jonathan? Yes, that's All righty. So Summer 19, do more summer 19com If you're a business and you'd like to bring a young person on board, uh, we'd love to have you. Uh, the university is doing a fantastic job of it, but we are looking for our private sector community to step up, uh, and I believe they'll do it because they've done it for the last three years. This is our fourth year. So that was my cheesy commercial for our young people. I asked about the future. I wanted to make sure as we're talking about diversity, empowerment, wraparound services, deduplicating work, uh, we have to prepare our young people to go in to the places that we're working in now, and we can serve as a bridge yeah. to make sure that they know the current workforce cares enough about them to invest. Uh, so I have another question. Uh, and Beulah, I'd like for you to kick this one off if you don't mind. Uh, what are benefits that you currently offer, or better yet, what benefits would you like to offer as you become uh, a master plumber at one point and you're owning all, your own business and you're employing five to 5,000 women across the country. Mm -hmm. uh, what would be some of the benefits that you would offer? Well, the benefits that I offer now is I teach people about water, you know, conserving water mm -hmm. and um, about how to insulate your pipes, and about how to know that your home is your biggest investment. So Please, when it comes to your plumbing electricity, please take care of it. So that's just something that I do now. I promote people to please take care of your home, your building, your business, because that's where you sleep, eat. That's how you pay your bills. So I'm doing that now, teach people about how to conserve water. Great, great. We only get one planet. Mm -hmm. uh, and so Mother Earth is screaming for us right now to start to look at how we're approaching living in a day and age where consumption is normal uh, and it is uh, at a higher rate than ever before. So thank you for thinking about uh, our lovely planet that we live, sleep, and eat in, right? We appreciate your, the, the thought. Uh, I'll go back up the road. Koi, how about yourself? Uh, what are benefits that you either currently offer or thinking innovatively? Are there some things you'd like to start to offer uh, at the empowerment plan? So my dream is to have like an on-site daycare. 
right? Yep. Yep. <laughs> um, because that's one of our biggest barriers. Um, we're not there yet. Um, so some of the benefits that we offer, we have what we try to be is like a one-stop shop. Um, where like 60% of the time our employees or team members are actually working in manufacturing, and 40% of the time we're working on that whole self. Um, so like right now we offer on-site GED classes. Um, we have an on-site therapist that's part-time, um, on-site driver's training. Um, we allow team members to take paid time to go to college classes, um, things like that. And we are. We just hired a, a career advancement manager wow. um, who is kind of similar to Ariel, which will help them. We know not everyone wants to stay at Empowerment Plan forever, right? Mm -hmm. And so her job is to figure out how to get that person from Empowerment Plan to their career goal. Wow. Um, and she will be partnering with different organizations. Um, Ariel and I are actually going to connect after we leave here. Um, but my dream is on-site daycare. Um, but we right. offer several benefits right now. Fantastic. So. You really are the uh, catalyst for connection here, huh, Ariel? You already got some <laughs> business developing there. How about yourself? Tell us what you're, uh, uh, you'd like to see or you currently have that is innovative in terms of uh, uh, benefits that you offer. Yeah, so I would say our biggest benefit is, of course, our minimum of paying $14 an hour. And as a staffing company, we're empowered to do that because we're able to set our billable rates um, that high. And what we've found is that a lot of companies are willing to pay it. Um, one, because they understand they get a quality service from us, but also they love the fact that they're contributing to um, the success of the community. Also, it keeps our staff coming back. So every time we decide we want somebody to pick up a shift, they're like, oh, I'm going to get $14 an hour there. I'm going right, to go there. Right. Um, but then the second thing I think is that connection to a positive social network, um, which has been vital for me, who um, I was a teen mom, and my son is here with me, um, and was vital to my family, my mother. I was one of those people who you didn't necessarily know when you, I walked through Cast Tech that we were homeless. Um, and we, um, just like Koi was sharing that, you don't, it doesn't mean you're living on the corner. But we had a positive social network of women, and I had mentors and a community around me that was able to connect me to resources so I could thrive and grow into the Marriott and grow into events production and things like that. And so I think those, um, having that, that positive social network and that, um, that financial stability is really you know, going to be beneficial for the people we serve. Great, great. Mr. President? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Well, <clears throat> some things that I definitely um, that I want to I want to benefit as I uh, progress in my career is I just want once I accomplish what, um, all my goals I just want to show the youth that anything you can put your mind to you can accomplish. You know you don't have to be the product of your environment. You can be the product that ultimately makes your environment. You know I want to make a life for the youth in the inner city is a. Uh, as easy as possible so they can be able to excel. And I, I definitely want to strengthen up some uh, domestic violence laws as well. Um, when, I was, when I was a baby, my mother was actually shot and killed by my father. So um, she was not only a domestic violence victim, but I was as well because ultimately I lost that time that I, I could have had with my mother. So I want to strengthen up on, on things like that and I want to start up my own uh, kind of nonprofit, like a, a 501c4, because I want to be able to have it in, polit in political, uh, the political realm as well, to be able to change that and help uh, domestic violence victims overcome the, the situations that they're facing now. So that's one thing that I want to change and I want to help benefit uh, the community. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I think we have a little bit more or less than a minute or so. Uh, so we're at time, but I do want to get this question out here. So I'll ask that if you can answer it in 10 words or less. Okay. All righty. So here's the challenge for you. I think you all are quite capable. Uh, in 2030, what would you like to see in the work world? I want to see more female plumbers. <laughs> more more female plumbers. You did it. Boom, there it is. I would say work life balance. Uh, empowerment for mothers in the workplace. No pressure. <laughs> no pressure. 
So some things that I would love to see in the, in the workforce. I would love to see single-payer health care. I would love to see $15 minimum wage. Yes. Um, Speaking folks' language. <laughs> and, and completely banning the box. So, you know, I don't want you. It's, it's been less than 10 words. But. Yeah. I, that was about nine and a half. That was worth don't it. Worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. So are we doing questions from the audience or no? All right. Well, save your questions for afterwards. How about that? They gives us time to stick around. Thank you.